I can't think of a more fitting place to be gathered to have this sort of discussion than in this sacred space, which must stand preeminent in our nation as a place dedicated to the idea that we can and must get along better with people with whom we disagree. Uh, I share a party with some in this room, not with others. I share a background, a skin color, a religion, a race, a national history story with some and not with others. But I grew up uh, with parents who taught me that I could and should and must believe in America. And we have a choice. And as we stand here in this place where people lost their lives, I think it's a sobering choice. The work that we are embarking on here with Disagree Better and with uh, all the work that's being done in Oklahoma and its schools, we hope someday, is trying to say we are making a choice for dignity. It is not an either or. You do not have to believe in your party or your political position or the issue at the expense of the dignity of the person you disagree with. We come together today because uh, it has become obvious to everyone that we in the United States have in many ways forgotten how to disagree with one another. In the National Governors Association, which is our bipartisan group of governors, believe it or not, we actually agree more than we disagree. And, and I just thought it'd be great for us to, to model kind of how we can talk about things. And we may have a difference of opinion uh, between each other, but we don't have to do it hatefully and we can argue. And I think that's where in business, that's where the best ideas come from is when we're uh, coming up with the best solution. And so I'm always encouraging people, uh, tell me why, why I should think differently about this situation. I want to learn from you. I want to start out with a story about the day after we finished our budget. The governor came to Tulsa and signed the levy bill. We thought nothing was going to happen. There's a bunch of my fellow legislators here. We did not think anything was going to come out of that legislature. We were waiting. There was budget summits. There was disagreements. We didn't know when we were going to get something done. But we got it together. We worked together. And the budget was voted on. And the very next day, the governor came to Tulsa. And every legislator from the area, our county commissioners, our local uh, city council, mayor, everyone was included to take care of this very important thing that was a long-term, high-dollar investment for the state. It mattered a lot because it was Tulsa's people, but it mattered a ton because it was an investment in showing that we could work together. And it was one of my best days that I've had in the legislature. I was proud to have supported that budget. I was proud to be there and that the governor, our governor, made that a priority to come and take care of public health, people, safety, the businesses in that area and knew that we needed to get that done and make a big show of it and bring us all together. And that was just such a great day to remember that it takes all of us working together to take care of Oklahomans. Bottom line, can you both agree that... We have a lot of work to do together on this. You, well, that's one, way, that's one way to put it. You both agree that each of you expressing disagreement will end up making whatever you end up doing stronger. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Okay. That's the whole key. The more that we prioritize uh, education rather than indoctrination, uh, when we uh, focus on going to the jugular of an idea rather than going for the jugular of a person, that's when we can create light rather than heat. And that that's not an easy experience. Uh, but that's the promise of higher education, that we shape and form our students so that they begin to see the big picture. We're all working together for the common good. The good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> and that he did that for a reason. And that's because there's a lot of times that we need to use the two ears and not use the one mouth. We want to be respectful and we want to make sure that people uh, feel heard and, and seen. And so we facilitate that by, again, not shying away from, um, you know, these, uh, current events. The Founding Fathers intentionally established a nation whose government was neutral to religion but which supported the religious freedom of all its citizens because they knew that faith has profound power to motivate 
good citizenship. How does your faith shape the way you interact with people in your life, in your business, particularly with those with whom you disagree? Less judgment, the ability to have passion, recognize that passion in somebody else is a commitment. There's something they believe in and they want to defend is how I deal with that. Yeah. The starting point for me is uh, that coming to the conclusion that you're not that great of a person, that you're not always right, that you don't possess rightness within yourself is actually a great starting point. I mean, really the word is humility. It's easy for me in moments sometimes to want to play the us first them game, you know, whether it's in business or other areas of my life, in my heart. And I always have to remind myself that what I believe um, is that I don't have it all together and, I don't, and, and that I have much um, that, you know, I'm coming from a place of humility and that helps. I think another thing that's really come from my faith being a central role in my life that really plays into being a business leader in particular is that I have a much higher view of the responsibility and social contract that comes with leading a company. I think there's more of a thirst for purpose and authenticity than ever before. I do too. And the world is desperate yes. for leaders that are honest and authentic and stand for something. When we model that, we talk about it, uh, and when you w break bread with people and you have honest conversations, just it's awesome what comes out of it, and you can see people's humanity, and you're not into corners, right? It's not Republican versus Democrats and, and uh, this race against this race or uh, this opinion versus this opinion. When we can actually come together and it's human on human contact, it's amazing how much we like each other and how what common ground we can find. Uh, when people see modeled the kinds of uh, relationships and dialogue that we're seeing today, you begin maybe just a little bit to believe more is possible. And then that becomes an infectious hope. I think these are skills. And I think they require practice. And I think we underestimate the importance of practicing these skills. Uh, we've always had tribes like, oh, you know, the Sooners versus the Cowboys, right? Or the Red Sox versus the Yankees or whoever it is, the Catholics versus the Protestants, violence, right? Black versus white, rich versus poor, gay versus straight, all these factions that have defined themselves to some extent by who they oppose. We need something, we need to do something that's never really been done, which is to create belonging, strong identity without hating the other identity. It doesn't mean I don't belong to my church or my tradition or my club or my, you know, a uh, Red Sox fan. Maybe I can other Yankee fans, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a hard thing to do. So we're gonna have to, I almost feel like civilization is asking us, maybe the gospel is even asking us, maybe the divine energies are asking us, I got a new challenge for humanity. And that is, to belong to your own community, but no hatred to other people's community. I think it's a big one. I think we're gonna have to really figure out how to do it. It's gonna take some work. Taking that break, getting counsel, you know, the, this, you know we all quote in some scriptures, but in a multitude of counselors is great right. wisdom. Uh, and so we don't have all the answers. We need to learn from others. And, I, and somebody even said it up here, having ears to uh, really wanting to understand. I think that's so important. So we need a generation of people in power who are willing to take the chance to lead with these values in order to allow the undercurrent of hope and aspirate and tolerance and welcome and good, deep, strong values and faith. Let that, uh, that current that is there rise. But right now it's there, but it gets crushed emotionally by the sense in which the powerful people are hateful people. And that's what we have to change. Right now, our Constitution is, is, is in danger. And what it's in danger from is this contempt. The Constitution can withstand vigorous disagreement. It was created for vigorous disagreement. But it cannot withstand a citizenry that holds one another in contempt. Each of us raises our game. We change the course of the country. And if we do it together in gatherings like this, we change the course of history. Uh, the insights I've learned mostly from the athletes of Special Olympics. Their oath is let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. I wish every politician would start their campaign with that oath. 
I wish every one of us who serves in legislatures or in school boards or on the bench would share that oath. Let my side prevail. But if it doesn't prevail, let me be brave. Let me treat others with dignity. Let me be a great American. Thank you.